Let's just pray. Lord, we just thank you for this time of togetherness. Lord, we just pray that you can use me to bring your words in the way that you want them to say. We ask that we leave here today with our, our eyes opened, our ears opened, and our hearts opened. We pray in your holy power on that. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning. Good morning. Um, you can probably kind of guess what the theme of this morning was about. Um, and uh, if you were here a few weeks ago, you will remember that um, I, I brought a, a, a particular message and said that the next time I was going to preach, it was going to be all about how we uh, live in obedience. Um, but Glennis brought that last week, and I thought rather than repeat another message that we'd already got, <coughs> I'll move on to something else. Um, now, many years ago, <coughs> I read a poem by a guy called Roger McGough, I think that's how you pronounce his name, and it's called The Leader. And it had a massive impact on me, uh, particularly within my army life, and I'd like to share that with you today. <clears throat> I want to be the leader. I want to be the leader. Can I be the leader? Can I? I can. Promise? Promise. Yippee! I'm the leader! Okay. What should we do? Oh, thank you. Now, we've all experienced someone purporting to be a leader at some stage in our lives. The political arena, the corporate businesses, the education system, governments, and even churches. We all have them. In fact, whenever there is a large body of people that gather for a function of some form or other, there's always going to be someone there that's going to be taking the lead. And there has to be. Because otherwise, things just don't get done. And we trust that they not only know what they're doing, but how they do it. Now, for some, being a leader comes naturally. It's in them. It's... it's it's the way they carry themselves. They just seem to ooze that kind of authority, even though they don't necessarily see themselves as leaders. For others, they have to learn how to be a leader. And that could be owing to a position that they hold within their job. They may have been promoted to manager. And they learn those skills through either attending courses or by being taught them through instruction, guidance and counsel from other people who may very well have been in those same sort of situations. And for others still, they have visions of grandeur that for when they're trying to lead, their leadership management and their leadership skills are about as much used as a chocolate teacup. Now from my own experiences, I've experienced all three types and for me, I've often found that the best leaders are those that do what's best for those that they are leading. They put their followers first and they put themselves second. You have faith in them. You respect them. You trust them to look after your own interests and you follow them because you wanted to, not because you felt you had to. Now whether it comes naturally, or you've had to work at it. Being a leader is a massive responsibility. And you can always wish to show that there's always someone behind you waiting to come forward to try and take your place. The fear of failing yourself, the fear of failing those that you're supposed to be leading, and the fear of failing those who have put their faith and trust in you to lead them is really stressful. Such is the importance of effective leadership that God wanted us to learn from the best. So he sent his son. Such was the effectiveness of Jesus' leadership that even some 2,000 years after he ascended to heaven, Millions are still following him. Why? Why? Well, hopefully, perhaps this morning, we're going to 
explore that. Because what Christ taught us had a profound effect on not only how we should be living our lives in the best way we can, but why we should be living our lives the best way we can. And through Christ's teachings, we learn that failing is all part of the process of building us up to be the best version of ourselves that we can possibly be. <clears throat> the Bible is full of great leaders, and the Bible is full of great leaders who have also failed. Elijah was a great leader and a great prophet who had so many miraculous experiences, and yet he felt he'd found God, which is quite surprising given the fact that he was a man who caused the rain to stop for more than three years. Ravens came and fed him. He saw a limitless amount of flour and, and oil flow from jugs. He witnessed a, a widow's son being resurrected and he even sent down raining balls of fire from heaven to beat the prophets of Baal. Yet when he learned that Jezebel wanted him <clears throat> killed, that was more than he could handle. And he fled into the wilderness. And that's where God met him. Elijah was at his wit's end, worried that God's judgment was going to come down on him because he felt he failed. But rather than God's judgment, God knew in his heart where he was at, and he allowed him to rest. And then when he was fully restored, God encouraged Elijah with a, with a small, still voice in his ear that simply said, you are not alone. I didn't mean to do that, sorry. <laughs> I didn't realize how loud that was going to come out. Now, we all know the story of Paul. We know his transformation. We know his restoration. We know all about his salvation. And yet, despite him doing a complete 360 degree turn, he too considered himself a failure. He even declared himself as being unworthy for God's work. So much so, but in his letter to Timothy, we read, Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. The opening of this is so important because what he's saying is, listen to me because I've been there. Christ came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I will show mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Jesus Christ might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. <clears throat> when Jesus accuses Peter that he will deny him three times, Peter scoffs and goes, <laughs> No way, man. <laughs> That's never going to happen. Well, we know how that turned out. And yet, despite his denial, when he realises that that prediction came true, he breaks down and weeps bitterly with regret and with remorse. And yet, despite Peter believing that he had found Jesus, Jesus didn't exclude him from his future plans. So much so, in fact, that Jesus, oh, sorry, that Peter was the first of the 12 disciples that Jesus presented himself to after he was resurrected. And then Peter went on to lead the, to the disciples. And then Peter went on and gave the very first evangelical message of which more than 3,000 people were saved. King David was another 
who was considered to be such a great leader, so much so that we read in 1 Samuel 13 and Acts 13 that God himself describes him as a man after his own heart because of the way that he demonstrated such great faith and was committed to following God. And even though David started off as such a royal and committed subject, he had a massive fall from grace where he not only considered himself a failure in the Lord's eyes, but he acknowledged that what he did wasn't just so much sinful acts, but that they were evil acts. <clears throat> David was king, but he'd also become an adulterer, a liar, a murderer, and a man who had lost his way. In his heart, he knew that he had displeased the Lord. He had stopped being a man after God's own heart and had become a man who desired what was in his own. <clears throat> and when the prophet Nathan confronts David and lays it all on the line for him, David immediately repents and confesses his sin. When his first son gets sick, David fasts, he prays, and he mourns in the hope that God will heal him. But unfortunately, the child dies. David doesn't point the finger and starts cursing blame. What he does is he receives that outcome as God's judgment and a consequence of David's actions and sinful ways for falling away and allowing temptation in. And yet, despite going through all that, God's forgiveness was ever present, as was God. And God still used David for greatness. Elijah, Peter, Paul, David, all great men, all great leaders. And yet, despite knowing what they should do, they were found. David was so stricken with grief about his failure that he wrote psalms about it. And Psalm 32 is such a psalm that is written in two halves. Verses 1 to 5 has David shouting for joy and praising God, having fully repented for his sinful evil acts and then seeing his transgressions being forgiven by God. And then in verses 6 to 11, we have David showing his acknowledgement of God's love and grace that brought him back to full restoration and salvation. <laughs> and his confidence that living and following God's way is ultimately the right way to go, despite all his failings. To get to that realisation, David has to first go through a process. He has to realise, he has to acknowledge, he has to accept, and he has to declare his sin. Do we have the second slide, Tony? Second slide? He's so engrossed. <laughs> but in order to receive that forgiveness from God, and following God's path and his leadership means that when we stumble, when we fall, when we fail, that forgiveness is there, ready for the giving. And it's ready for the taking. In verse 8, next slide, the Lord tells David, I will teach you the way you should go. I will instruct you and advise you. Now this forces us to look deep within ourselves and address the inner self as to whether, when we're feeling that way, we will accept God's help or whether we will continue to lean on our own understanding. Do we willingly follow God in all situations or only when we start to feel lost, when we start to feel like we're failing, 
And then we start looking for excuses to justify doing the things our own way. Solomon grasped this, and he must have learned something from, from his father, because he tells us in Proverbs 3, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. Now David's journey, on reflection, probably wasn't a pleasant one. And yet to understand what he went through, David gives us a helping hand by acknowledging three undeniably biblical facts. Biblical fact number one, God says, I will instruct you. Now instruction is usually based on providing detailed step-by-step -step directions on how something should be done. And for many of us here, we drive a car. But at the time, it wasn't a case of us jumping in the driving seat and, and, and away we went. We had to go through a process of undergoing a series of lessons and instructions on how to drive the car. We had to know which pedal did what. We had to know what levers did what. And for those of you young enough, we needed to understand that when you pulled the choke out, it not only helped the car to start, but it was some way for the ladies to be able to hang their handbags. <laughs> oh, I've lost your place now. <laughs> qualifications in order to be able to teach and instruct. We need to know that their experience is good enough based on the number of years that they've been driving, coupled with how many people have they got through their driving tests. And we know to we need to know that they also have wisdom. That when they take us for driving lessons, it was based on our own skill set, not on someone else's. People grow and develop at different, different paces, different, different rates. And what's good for me won't necessarily be good for someone else. But when God tells us, I will instruct you, be assured that what he will give us will be detailed in directions <coughs> to fulfill that of which he's asking for us. God is telling us that he will go before us and that our path will be safe and secure. Our faith and belief in this is based on all the marvellous times that he's done this for others that we read about in the Bible. And that's also coupled with first-hand knowledge of situations and witness testimony that we've experienced ourselves or we've heard from others. <clears throat> Proverbs 4 says, Hold on to instruction, do not let it go, Guard it well, for it is your life. Biblical fact number two. God says, I will teach you the way you should go. Now our level of learning in the main is taught while we're at school. Now I came from a school that had old school type teachers. They were the kind of teachers that... If they felt that your focus was waning or your concentration wasn't where it should be, you would find a piece of chalk or the board rubber being lobbed at your head. We had another teacher that took great delight in going around and slapping you across the back of the hand with a ruler. The white, dusty, chalky marks that we'd walk out of class with on our black blazers was a sign to everyone else that we'd been caught out misbehaving. But it was worn like a badge of honour. Yeah, look at that. Unfortunately, my mum and dad didn't really see it as a badge of honour when I'm walking home. She's like, I've got to wash your blazer again now. It wasn't really a rough school that I went to, but it did have its fair share of rough students. And you knew what teachers you could mess around with. 
you knew what teachers you could have a laugh with because they would laugh with you, and you knew which teachers you just completely avoided and you just went in and you put your head down and you just went. For them, I can only assume that their behaviour was such that they didn't want to see us failing. And even though their teaching methods might have been a bit barbaric in today's standards, it worked. Look at me now. <laughs> God is never going to throw a piece of chalk or a ball rubber at you. And God is never going to slap you across the back of the hand with a ruler. But he is going to leave an imprint if we don't follow his teaching. God teaches us that a clear and unobstructed direction for the way to salvation is only through his teaching. And to understand his teaching, we need to be prepared to declare our wrongdoings, our misbehaviours, and understand, as it says in Luke 1 verse 37, nothing is impossible with God. Another confirmation that we don't travel this Christian life alone. Biblical fact number three. God says, I will advise you. How many times have we had somebody come up to us and say, can I give you a piece of advice? Or how many times have we said that to someone else? See, giving advice is about offering up suggestions that reflect the best course of action that someone else should take. The issue with that is that the advice is usually objective. And it's usually based on what the person that's offering it would do if they were in that situation. Which is not necessarily good for the person <coughs> in that situation. Accepting advice is only ever good if it turns out okay. Because if it all goes pear-shaped, we tend to look at the person that's giving it to us point the finger and blame. But we know that without any doubt, when God advises us to go a certain way or to do something, the only thing that's going to go wrong with that is what we caused ourselves. We may fail to follow the instructions that he's given us. Maybe we just haven't paid attention enough to the instructions that he's given us. Or maybe it's just simply because we think we know better or we know best. In verse 9 of this psalm, having found the redemption that David was seeking, he advises us not to be as foolish as he was. And he tells us, next slide, Tom. Oh, I said, sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Do not be like the horse or the mule, which have no understanding, but must be controlled by a bit and bridle, or they will not come to you. Now, I don't know if we've got any horsey lovers here, um, and if we have, then you will know that there are some component parts that are required in order to ride a horse or control a horse. You need a saddle. You need a bit, you need a bridle, and you need the reins. None of which work independently, but together it allows you to control the direction and speed that a horse takes. Pull the reins to the left, the bit in the mouth will cause the horse to go left. Pull right, the horse will go right. If the horse starts going too fast, you pull all the reins together, and the bit in the mouth goes in, further in and causes the horse to stop. Now, whether this causes the horse any pain or not, I have no idea. I'm not a horse. Although on occasions I have been told at times that I can be a bit of an ass. <laughs> but I can only imagine that it's not a comfortable thing to have. Imagine walking around all day with a pencil in your mouth and a bit of string tied to both ends and someone standing behind you, pulling on the strings, controlling and guiding your every movement. 
See, way back in Genesis, in, in chapter 28, God tells us, I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go. Now, this also applied to Elijah, Peter, and Paul. And when God tells David that he will always be watching over him and protecting him, we can rest easy knowing that that same level of protection applies to each and every one of us. Our relationship with God will never be like having a bit in our mouths, <clears throat> which God will use to control us, keep us close to him, or cause us pain. Yet sometimes, it may definitely feel that way. But this pain is not necessarily a physical one. Mostly, it will probably be pain that we feel in our hearts <coughs> because we've done something that we know is displeasing to God. We've allowed our situation and our circumstance to direct the path that we're going down. We've taken out that symbolic bit from our mouths and now we're going in our own direction instead of God's. And it may just feel like we're failing. <coughs> God doesn't cause or create the negative stuff that happens in our lives. Mostly that's down to us through poor or ill-advised choices that we might make. Other times it's circumstances outside and beyond our control, but not God's. God will always be there to give us the strength to get through, or to get through it, and will always be there to show us the way out. That's God instructing. That's God teaching. And that's God advising us. The very same God that we trust and follow. When our focus on God slips, when we allow a temptation to get in the way, when we stop following the only true leader in our lives, that's when things start to go a little off piste. So how do we make every possible effort that we don't slip? That we resist that temptation, that we continue to follow God and ensure that failure doesn't get the last word? Well, we can learn from the greats. We can learn from the best. We can look at the lessons that we've previously learned from the likes of Elijah, Peter, Paul and David. When we've sinned, we must recognise it and we must repent. God's forgiveness doesn't save us from the consequences of those actions. But if we've abandoned the sinful behaviour and we're willing to accept those consequences, which are undoubtedly going to come, God can and still will use us. Having run into the wilderness, Elijah's encounter was due to him simply being burnt out. He was spent. He'd taken on way more than he could physically handle, despite constantly wanting to please God. And that's why God gave him the rest. Here's the thing. If you don't find the rest, Rest assured, God's going to find it for you. When we feel burned out, when we feel run down, we can also feel vulnerable. Burnout is only permanent if you allow it to be. Don't listen to everything that you're tempted to believe in when you're exhausted. It's easy to find and believe in things that feed and support your own take on the world when you're feeling run down. And it's also easy to reflect on things that you haven't done great, which leads to that sense of failure. It's so important that you take time to care for yourself physically, spiritually and emotionally. Then, when you're back to firing on all four cylinders, you can get right back in the game. Peter wasn't ready to hear what Jesus told him. The worst was, he didn't believe him. Yet when that denial came as predicted, it broke him. Despite the greatness that Peter went on to later to achieve, it teaches us that we all develop gradually. 
We all develop at different rates and we all develop over time. Our Christian maturity isn't based on the things we do for God. It's based on how we take on board that instruction, that guidance and that advice, and how we then use it effectively. Failure isn't always a sign that we can't cut it. Sometimes we're just trying to operate at a level that we're not mature enough to handle at that time. But the great thing is, is that we can always outgrow those kinds of failings. The important thing is, we don't give up. <clears throat> I like Paul, I came to Christ late in life and many times I've found myself reflecting back on my past and I'm not proud of who I was. I'm pretty appalled by some of the things that I did. And when I gave my life to Jesus at the age of 38, not once did I think that God would ever use me in the way that he has. Like Paul, I felt that my transgressions, my sinful behaviour, had caused me to be unworthy for anything good. But like Paul, the lesson we learn from his story is that for those who put their trust in Christ later in life, there are bound to be reasons that we may feel unqualified for service. But the gospel is so powerful that our transformation becomes a profound testimony to God's greatness and God's grace. We are all worthy. And God can use every single one of us, regardless of how great or small we might feel our failures were or are. Failure doesn't disqualify us, even if we've been following Jesus for some time, or all our life. Now I said a few sermons back that God writes our story and we are merely the narrators. And our story is still being written. And the only way that failure can get the last word in our life story is if we choose to allow it. Now I said at the start, such was the effectiveness of Jesus' leadership that some 2,000 years after he ascended to heaven, millions were still following him. And then I pose the question, why? <coughs> well, whether you've been walking with God faithfully throughout your life, or you've come to him late in life, I dare say we've all encountered defeats. We've all encountered stumbles, we've all fallen, and we've all failed at some point. But we serve a God who is able to take all of that, to continually restore us, to bring glory to his name, and to continually encourage us to help build his kingdom. There is no turning back. Because everything that we need is in Him. That's our leader. That's our God. That's Jesus. And that's why we follow Him. Stay strong. Stay safe and stay in faith. And until next time, may God continue to bless each and every one of you in your journey. As David said at the end of his psalm, Rejoice in the Lord and be glad, you righteous. And I'm going to ask you all now to stand as we sing, all of you who are upright in heart, I have decided to follow Jesus. There is no time.